Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to The Sun Never Sets, Connected Education Around the World. This is part of the three-day kickoff for Connected Educator Month. This has been a blast. It is our third day. For me, this is actually my last session, uh, but there is so much going on, last session of the day. There is so much going on. We hope that you will uh, find lots to do as part of Connected Educator Month. There is a link on the screen for our newsletter. Sign up. If you sign up, uh, you'll be kept informed. Uh, we have great forum discussions going through the month. I've got a Learning 2.0 virtual conference that will take place uh, the third week of the month. And then we have uh, all kinds of tours and exciting ways to help educators connect with each other. And then a uh, set of closing ceremonies and sessions. So the sun never sets for these conferences is right. That's a good title for what we're doing. Uh, we have with us. Vicki Davis, Ed Greger, Lucy Gray, Julie Lindsay, and Ann Merchant. And it's kind of a miracle that they are all here. So this will be really fun. I'm going to turn my uh, video off so that nobody has any kind of bandwidth issues. But uh, I'm going to uh, get us started by asking uh, each of the panelists to tell us a little bit about themselves, say 30 to 40 seconds worth. And in the process of that, I'm hoping that you will answer a question. And that question is, uh, I'll give a little bit of background. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking in the last three days about the parallels between teacher learning and student learning and the importance of supporting teacher learning and experiences to help inform their activities with students. So as you uh, introduce yourselves, I wonder if you wouldn't also talk about how important you think it is for educators to have their own globally connecting experiences. And Vicki, can we start with you? Sure. Um, you know, the first step, when Julie and I sat down to write our book, Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds, the very first step that we felt in flattening a classroom is to connect yourself. Because when you connect yourself, um, you you start experiencing the transformation that has happened. And I know that many people who have been teaching a long time say that it's a complete renaissance of their teaching when they start connecting. And you know, the thing is, though, to remember that, you know, I've seen blog posts that say every teacher should be on Twitter, or every teacher should be here, every teacher should be there. You know, I think that building a personal learning network or a PLN is completely different depending upon the teacher. So the question is, are you connecting? Are you joining in the conversations in the network. And for me, um, it's just been a complete transformation of my life. I would put it right up there, uh, connecting with others, right up there um, You know, after having my children and, and getting married as one of the most important things that's ever happened to me. So um, that's those are my thoughts of that. Thanks, Vicki. I love that. I think you said personal learning renaissance. Ed, how about you? And Ed, we're not hearing you. I wonder if your mic is on. So Ed's having trouble turning his mic on. Let's check, Ed. Your audio is there. You're just not able to click on the talk button. I'm going to suggest maybe that you log off and log back on. Not sure what that is. But while we're waiting for you to come back, let's go with Lucy. Hi, everybody. I'm Lucy Gray, and I'm the co-chair of the uh, Global Education Conference along with Steve. And we're really excited to have everybody assembled here. Um, everybody that you're hearing from today has been involved um, big time with our conference, and we're excited to have them participate in this year's event, uh, which will take place November 12th through 16th, completely online. I'm in, in uh, where am I right now? I have no idea where I am because I've been all over this summer. <laughs> I'm in Montana right now, sitting in a college friend's uh, kitchen. She has chickens outside, so if you hear uh, them clucking, you'll know why. Um, anyway, I'm getting back from vacation mode here, and I'm trying to think about the question, Steve. And I think um, I have to echo what, what Vicki just said. I think that you have to model a lot of this stuff for your, your kids, and you need to understand how things work um, if you're going to create experiences for your students. And um, the other thing I will also add is that you need to have a significant network to rely on if you want opportunities to happen, I think. 
So you don't necessarily always have to be jumping in and talking and, and being part of the conversation. You can lurk and you can, you can listen. Um, but you need to, to follow enough people via social media and that sort of thing in order to really kind of um, have a, I don't know, uh, enough people to, to really engage with, I guess. So um, it's changed my life, too. Uh, the past, I don't know, five years or so um, has really, this connectedness has really changed how I work. And I don't think there goes a week, maybe not a day, where I don't talk to somebody through social media that's in another country. So that's my two cents. Well, the fun of this session is that we are modeling so very well. Uh, Anne just posted that she can hear the, the rooster crowing because it's uh, dawn there where she is. Ed, did your microphone uh, situation get cleared up? I think so. Uh, sorry for the We lap. can hear you. Uh, I just, just wanted to correct one thing on the bio that's up there, and that is that uh, I am now, after 20-some years, the Executive Director Emeritus of Higher in USA, and Lisa Johnson is the Executive Director. Uh, I'm now with an organization here in Washington, D.C. called the Global Campaign for Education U.S. Uh, such a pleasure to be part of this group. Um, and in terms of answering the, the question, Steve, you know, I guess I'd address it two ways. One is that um, you know, over the years we've had these uh, online courses for educators uh, where they participate over a four to eight week online course interacting with their peers, with their colleagues all over the world. Uh, learning how to do this in the classroom and before they actually engage with their students. And it's such a powerful uh, way to overcome the learning curve. And the teachers then create their own support structure with the educators that they have they've worked with over that, that period of time uh, so that uh, when it comes time to actually engage in their class and collaborative work internationally, they have uh, contacts, they have friends all over the world who are educators who have done the same thing. And the other thing is that I would say that, you know, um, most of our teacher education programs don't prepare teachers very well to work with teachers in the next classroom, much less globally. And so to be able to cross boundaries, to cross uh, time zones and cultures and educational systems and languages, uh, it's tough. And so the more our experiences, the more educators have a chance to network with their colleagues first. Uh, it's a powerful way to facilitate then student learning using this amazing technology. Thanks, Ed. So glad to have you back. OK, so there, there's a lot of chat going on. And, and that makes it very hard to see if you leave the chat window in its small location that's the default. So if you look at the top of that chat window, everyone, you'll notice there's a little options menu. And you can detach that chat and make it larger. You can also double click and drag the, drag the chat box out and do the same thing. Um, Julie, let's have you introduce yourself and, and, and address the same question. Hi, everyone. Julie Lindsay here. I'm a co founder and director of Flat Classroom with my friend and colleague, Vicki Davis. Great to be in the same room with everyone. Uh, I am uh, an international educator, originally from Australia, and I've been out of Australia for 15 years. But wait, hang on, I'm back in Australia now, so I'm, I'm a bit sort of a little bit of culture shock after nearly 15 years uh, teaching in five different countries. So um, just hearing people say how it's changed their lives, it's certainly changed my life. The, the connectivity that's been made possible through Web 2.0 uh, and the internet, and the fact that I'm now sitting in this fairly isolated because it's winter here in Australia, a beach resort, uh, and I'm able to connect with the world, uh, uh, is is um, is just amazing. Uh, and I think as an educator, it's always essential now to understand that you can connect your classroom, you can bring the outside world in and bring your classroom out to the world through Simple things like Skype, through simple things like wiki collaborations, etc., and uh, to remember to be flexible as an educator. When we're talking global, we also need to be talking flexibility uh, in terms of well, you know, it's 7 a.m. here. I already had a 6 a.m. meeting. This is my 7 a.m. meeting. Uh, I had uh, a meeting with Italy yesterday. I had a, a, a midnight meeting with the Fairfax County in. Uh, USA, etc. So, you know, my timetable is all over the place, and I think for educators, you also need to get your head around that it's not just a an eight to four job anymore. It's really global, and it's 24 hours, and 
you need to work your life around that to an extent. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. If somebody wasn't scared off already, they might be now. But hey, stick with us. Lots of fun. Hey, Anne, let's have you do the same. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am down in southeast Australia. I live on a farm. I live three and a half hours drive from Melbourne, our major city. A small rural school that's classified geogra um, rural remote by our education department. Our students are rural uh, and also geographically culturally related. But technology has opened up the world. So Anne, if you can hear us, we oh. lost you. You went scratchy. Oh, you're back now. I know we know you're on very limited bandwidth, but uh, let's give you a try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I live in a really small, geographically um, and culturally isolated area on a farm. We have no mobile phone or cell phone service where I live. Our internet bandwidth is not good on the farm, um, but it doesn't matter because we've got technology, and I can, and me and my students can learn in real time from people who actually live in other places. We understand their cultures, their feelings, their passions, uh, geography, history. We learn so much from them. So textbooks to me don't give that same feeling. Um, and that's why I love being connected. And if you've got passion and connections, you can teach and learn anything. And you're a great example of that. And thanks for persevering through the bandwidth. We were able to hear everything you said there uh, perfectly. So I'm going to do something uh, that I didn't expect to do right off the bat. But I'm looking at this audience and thinking, this is a terrific group of people here. And I'm going to put up a blank page and give you all rights to um, edit the whiteboard. And you'll notice there's a little text tool. That's the fourth one down. And if you click on it, you can either do a paragraph or a single line of text. While we're going through this uh, session, to be interesting, if you want to make notes about uh, things that you find are important or, or ways in which you would encourage others to become involved and globally connected, um, certainly this doesn't replace the chat, but things that you might want to have a little bit more permanent so we can see them on the whiteboard. OK, so now I'm going to start with questions for the panelists. I am going to ask a specific panelist each time the question, but if another panelist would like to weigh in, and I hope that you will, please feel free to raise your hand. So Julie, how does an educator go about finding another educator or a class to collaborate with? Mm. This is a question that everybody asks all the time, Steve, and it's um, you know it's really joining networks. I've just put our flat classrooms network up there, and Lucy's put the globaleducationconference.com network up on the board as well. It's really getting in there and trying to find a like-minded person, at least one, you know, and just find finding one is good. If you find more than one, well, that's even better. But finding that person, like when Vicky and I found each other, you know, five and a half years ago, there was that spark. And we, we did that project, and then it, it grew into bigger things, as you know. But it's finding someone who's uh, doing something similar to you in the classroom who you can build something around. Um, or, of course, another thing is, of course, is to join an existing project. And there are a lot of projects out there, including the Slack Classroom set of projects, but there are other ones as well, global um, projects that people can join. And as a newbie, if you're new to global collaboration and global education, it's good to get your feet wet uh, amongst people who have done it before. So they're my two suggestions. Great. And, and other panelists, if you'd like to reply, we'd love to hear from you. Just raise your hand. When we were at the Asia Society Conference doing a panel not unlike this one, uh, I sat next to a woman from Princeton, New Jersey, who thought about uh, trying to do uh, collaborations with inside the United States first as a first case. Um, you know, say a time zone or two away, or you know, from the northeast to the southwest. Has anybody uh, on the panel done that and felt like that was a value in sort of getting your feet wet? Uh, um, Steve, um, we do see that in a number of countries in Iron. And one example, for example, 
there were originally a number of schools within Native American communities that wanted to link. And they wanted first to link amongst communities that were only in this culture uh, to see where the similarities were, the differences, the cultural um, commonalities were before they wanted, before they then uh, took the step to go international. And it was very helpful actually for them to gain both the experience but also the confidence uh, that it takes to reach out uh, to folks internationally when you've never had a contact with people outside the United States. And so they found it as a confidence and a learning building process to work first within their own communities in the United States before reaching out. Terrific, Ed. Vicki, did you want to take the mic? Uh, yes. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is a lot of times people think that flattening or c flattening your classroom or connecting your classroom means that you have to go global. And um, again, in our book, for those of you who have it, it's on page 51, there are five real ways I think that students need to connect to have a truly flattened um, or, or whole, full experience. And one is location. The inner circle for students is essential. Their home, their class, their school, their neighborhood, and their city. That's very, very important. But I believe the students need to connect to their state, their nation, their continent, their hemisphere, and the world so that they have a well-rounded experience. Uh, the others, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but the second one is communication. They need to um, be comfortable with both the synchronous and asynchronous experiences as well as face-to-face. -face. Uh, generation, we need to be connecting you know, across generations, older, younger, um, that sort of thing. All types of information is very important, uh, not just your textbook, not just your teacher, but learning to connect to all different types of information. And then students need to connect to themselves across time. So they need to be uh, building a digital portfolio of all of these different things they've done and all these different connections. And they need to be able to access that in the future and, and not have it saved on a server at their school that's deleted when they leave. So I think that flattening the classroom or globally connecting the classroom is not just about the other side of the world. It is about down the street, and that's very important. As for which way you start first, um, I don't think there's one pattern. So Rhonda, I will type in the, in the chat the ways that you, that you can connect the classroom. There are five. Terrific. So uh, Lucy, certainly there's the global education name, um, and there are the iron programs. Are there any other sort of quick places you would want to refer people to to help them find another educator, whether within their own country or outside, for this kind of connecting? Lucy, if you've raised your hand, I'm just going to encourage you to talk without waiting for me to call on you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, two places. Like, there are a lot of different places that um, are good starting points, and one of them is ePels. And I think Tim is here in the room right now with us, Tim Disipio. Another one is Taking It Global, which um, is great for high school students in particular and focuses on different global issues. They also provide professional development. Um, some other groups that have been really active in our community have been Primary Source in Massachusetts, uh, World Savvy in terms of curriculum and that sort of thing. So those are a couple places where to start. Um, I'll, I'll also post some slides that I use for presentations that give some good starting points as well. Stephen, another source is um, uh, the Organization of American States, the OAS, also has a teacher network called I-10, International Teacher Education oh, Network, yeah. uh, that uh, is a great place for linking with educators in both English Spanish and Portuguese uh, speaking educators in the Americas. Terrific, Ed. And I don't know, Vicki, if you know, but your mic is on. Okay, so, uh, Ed, I'd actually like to come back to you for this next question. Uh, there is a, there is a, they're hoping that you'll, you'll mention in the chat uh, or put a link to the, um, to that I-10. I think it's I-T-E-N, right? But, Ed, I'm interested in, uh, for those who are, trying to communicate with uh, teachers or classrooms from another country in a different language. How do you start overcoming, or how do you overcome the language barriers? Um, I mean, that's, that's a critical question. And it's actually one, of course, that mo many uh, US teachers are uh, somewhat intimidated by, uh, because so many folks in our country don't speak another language. And so the first question is, there how can I link with other kids who only speak, who speak English first? 
Um, and that's, that's, that's great, and there are lots of ways that that can happen. Uh, but there are also a number of uh, ways in which, uh, by teaming up in project work with teachers that are bilingual, that allow uh, project interaction work to take place in several languages, uh, that's another way. The other way that we've seen a lot of is, is where we engage the language teachers at various schools. And so the French teacher down the hall, who had never thought about actually working internationally, uh, can actually be an aid to you, perhaps as a social studies teacher, in a link with a francophone country in West Africa to deal with an environmental issue or a project. And so the actual the interaction that takes place between the U.S. and the kids in Mali, uh, in West Africa, um, can in fact be the content and the subject matter for the French language class. Uh, and then students are actually doing that uh, translating for each other as part of the language program. And as all of us know, uh, working with an authentic audience and with a real uh, kids writing is so motivational for other students uh, to actually want to learn a language, but also see the value and the, the, the benefit of them having that skill. Um, we also have done a lot of work uh, with Google Translate. Uh, so every one of the 53 languages that they handle, uh, albeit a machine translation, uh, is available. And that can be embedded in every level of, of student to student or teacher to teacher interaction. And although they you know, may not be the best translation, it certainly gives you a great sense of the gist of what's being discussed. Uh, so that people are included as, as opposed to being excluded from, from the discussion simply because of language. So I don't want anybody uh, participating to get nervous that there, there are links in the chat they're not going to be able to reference later. So just know that you can watch this as a recording. You can also go up to File and Save, and you can save the chat at the end of the session. Lucy, is your hand up, uh, new, is your hand up for a new comment? We'd love to hear from you. And how about you? Living and teaching in Australia means that our time zone is probably one of the most difficult to be able to connect with uh, countries that speak English as their first language. So we connect in real time with Asia quite a bit, with government schools. So we find um, that we need to have objects. If we video conference, we need to use the chat all the time as well as our audio voices. Uh, we have demonstrations like we might share cooking, recipes, um, singing, pictures, etc. And the students are so keen to make each other understand. They mime, they do whatever they can to make sure that we can communicate somehow in real time. Lovely, Anne. So, um, Julie, I think you mentioned Google Translate early on, and, and several others have mentioned it here. Does it make sense to identify the difference between synchronous and asynchronous uh, connections and ways in which uh, it appears that Google Translate actually could work in both, but, but maybe works differently in each one? Yes. Um, of course, I think a lot of people, when they first think about global collaboration or, or connecting with the world, they think they think Skype, they think real time, they think synchronous, and has, as Anne just alluded to, you know, depending on your time zone, of course, you you literally cannot connect with all parts of the world without somebody being in the evening and someone being in the morning. And uh, you know, when I was in China, I often had people connect with me and say, I'd like my class to Skype with one of your classrooms in your school in China. And often these people were from the USA, and I'd say, well. Who's going to come in at night, and um, et cetera? Who's going to do the 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 bit where it's not in the classroom? So, so that's one challenge uh, to be able to sync time zones and to sync. Uh, if you don't want to do real time, you've got to set it up. But then, of course, the the real beauty of global collaboration is being able to work in asynchronous mode uh, and being able to use the tools, Web 2.0 tools or other tools or uh, whatever, you know, voice threads, wiki, blog, etc., and knowing how to use those for effective learning. Um, and, uh, networks like Ning or Edmodo. Uh, and that's, that's where many teachers still struggle, I think, uh, how to uh, share these ideas and experiences and um, lead their students into a global project or into effective collaboration using asynchronous, an asynchronous approach. Anyone else like to? add to that. 
So we've talked about where we can find student projects. Is there a specific place that, that anybody here likes to go just for teachers to connect with other teachers for that first step? Vicki mentions it's Black Classroom Ning. Penny saying Facebook groups, Twitter. Go ahead, Ann. Um, Steve, I really like the global online sites like Classroom 2.0, the global education, uh, Ning, etc. I also like Twitter. If people are on Twitter, there's usually someone looking for someone to connect with. And our first connection then is often just email. Everyone's comfortable with email. Then it builds up to Skype, testing Skype between just the two teachers or people interested in connecting, and then making sure that works and then bringing in the class. Terrific. And Steve, okay. within, within yeah. Iron, it's, it's um, the teacher's lounge. Uh, it's a place where new teachers are introducing themselves all the time. And they're throwing out ideas. They're, they're, they're taking the first step, as you just mentioned. Uh, they're asking questions. They're saying, I'm new. How do I begin? And so it's a way to basically both be teacher and learner at the same time. Because you know we have a philosophy that uh, you know no one knows so little they can't, don't have something to teach. And so if you were new six months ago, you're now the old person. And you have something to teach that new person who just came in. And so we really encourage teachers to go into that room and literally just meet each other and just say, introduce themselves and say something about themselves and their school and their teaching to start creating those personal bond, personal and professional bonds. Terrific. Um, what about finding the time? Um, does that does that come up for, for any of you? And Lucy, just go ahead and grab the mic. Yeah, I wanted to add one more thing about starting places and, and where to go to, to get going with things. Um, one of the success stories in our community has been um, a gentleman by the name of Rob Sabaglia, which apparently means mistake in Italian. He's an Italian-Australian. And um, I've had him participate in several chats this summer and, for, and promoting his work with something called the Writers Club. And I don't, I'll find the link and I'll put it in the chat and on the whiteboard. Um, but he's looking for specific um, schools in different parts of the world to to participate in this community of, I think there are over a thousand kids right now who are doing authentic writing projects that are, are student generated. Um, and he's only been doing this for about a year. So he's created a really nice community for people to get started and jump in. And I think it's pretty engaging for kids. So you guys might want to take a look at that. He has moved to another school. Um, Lisa, so I'm not sure if that's the correct link or not. Uh, let me look for it in a minute. You know, Steve, I think that you know burnout is a problem for some teachers, and you still have to keep balance. But there's a great book called The Power of Habit, and if 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 habits do anything, they make global collaborative projects possible for educators. Because there's something that underlines every every connection, and that is the the, the habits of connecting. So there are three R's of global collaboration: uh, receive, read, and respond. And that's one of the biggest uh, habits that you have to have because you have to number one make sure that you're receiving the feedback or receiving the connections that are coming into you, and that's a real problem for many teachers who are behind firewalls. So you know that's why many uh, teachers set up their own Gmail accounts they can check at home because the Barracuda firewalls will just eat people's emails from different places from around the world, especially if it's a place that has a lot of you know hackers and that sort of thing. The second thing is read, and you really have to schedule time to read and um, and see what's going on uh, in in your selected communities. You don't have to be a participant everywhere, but you know, wherever you're going to participate, just go in there and check and see what's going on and being engaged. But also check your email. There are many people who sign up for projects and they miss those emails that tell them how to get started. So it's very important to be re reading. But then the last piece is responding. You know, there are a lot of people that want to connect, but they don't go back and respond and say, yes, I want to do this. The other tip is for me, um, because this year I'll actually uh, be teaching for part of the year, seven classes, which is just too many since I have you know seven periods a day. But I take 15 minutes three times a week 
to make sure that I am learning new things and experimenting with new things uh, on my list. So you really have to kind of put it into your habits um, every week that this is what I'm going to do. And it doesn't have to be an hour or three hours or five hours, just a little bit of time here and there to check your email and to read up and to check on new things. And um, I have to do 15 minutes, Marina, because that's the amount of time I have at break, the only time I'm alone in my room. If there's anybody who's an expert on efficiency, it is Vicki Davis. Um, Vicki, what about getting administrative or parent support? Um, certainly for uh, U.S. educators, this has got to be an issue, right? Well, establishing trust is very important. Um, you know, I'm not really a fan of, of this. Some teachers say they have to have clandestine global collaborations and connections, and I just believe in being upfront. And you know, the very first project Julie and I did, I had a, this is the only time I've ever been called into the office for flat classroom. It was six years ago, and a teacher, a, a parent, was concerned that the students from Bangladesh were going to come through the computer and somehow bomb us through the computer. And I know it sounds preposterous, but it's true. And it's it's. You have to get these things out on the table, communicate to parents. Um, I now do a weekly email to all of my parents through PowerSchool. There's a feature in there that lets me do that to keep them up front with this is what's going on, this is what we're doing. If we have any problems, which they're pretty rare, but sometimes they happen. One, one time we did have a somewhat of a cyberbullying incident that happened. And so I just put it out on the table and communicate with the parents. And then, you know, when I want to do something new, I take it to the administration and say, okay, here's how it aligns with the objective. I'm going to throw a link in right when I get done because some people say, well, I can't do global projects because they don't align with standards. And that's actually not true. Um, Susie Nestico does our flat classroom projects and she aligns with standards. And I've got a new book coming out in, uh, in, um, December or January called uh, Collaborative Writing in the Cloud, and it actually takes the Common Core writing standards and aligns with collaborative work that you have out there. So these are things you can do to increase student learning, and it is possible you can do it. But the big thing, Steve, is that um, used to five or six years ago, I could believe those excuses, but now because there's so many people doing these projects and doing and connecting globally, you can find somebody in your similar circumstance that you can emulate. So to me, there's not really excuses anymore. Yeah, yeah I just, just want to emphasize a little bit of what Vicki just said in terms of um, we've spent a fair amount of time in terms of getting teachers, get, getting teachers the ability to get permission and get to do this kind of uh, work when it, it isn't clear to a lot of people how it fits standards. We've done a lot of work uh, to, to map collaborative uh, international project work online to the Common Core State Standards now. And to, I think it's something that we all in our field have to really put more effort into to really identify what, and thank goodness the Common Core is out there instead of having to deal with 50 state standards, but to how, how do these kinds of collaborative projects fit specific uh, elements of the Common Core helps teachers actually go to a principal, go to someone who does that questioning you know, justify, please, teacher, why you're doing this when when my teach when my student needs to uh, uh, get a certain score on a test. And so I think it's up to us in the field to play a key role in moving that whole process forward. Looks like someone from the Iron Office just dropped a link in there with a letter explaining to parents why global collaboration is important. That that would be a good thing to share, I think. Okay. Um, What about differences in uh, resources, bandwidth, technology? Um, how do you overcome or address those when you're trying to collaborate with someone who's uh, in a very different circumstance than you are? Would anybody like to answer that question? So I think Ed's hand is still up from before, and do you want to go ahead? Uh, Steve and everyone, I am the perfect example in my school about that uh, problem with access. We have limited technology, or we did, our bandwidth is not strong, and nor are a lot of the countries that we connect with, but there is always one tool, um, all you need is one laptop or one computer in the classroom to be able to start 
um, and get connected and from there everything will flow. But you find um, if the bandwidth doesn't work one day, have a backup plan, do it a little bit later on. Go back to just emailing whatever suits and works with both. Yeah, and that's a fantastic point. It, it, it's clear that um, uh, you have to be flexible uh, because of those differences in circumstances. And so instead of going into a community in various countries, and, and because we have the support structure in each one of the countries, there's actually somebody locally that can help schools in various countries with very specific uh, needs. But instead of going to those schools and saying, here is what you have to have in order to participate, it's a question of asking, all right, what is available somewhere in your community that will allow your students to gain access to this incredible world? And for me, for us, our experience is it's not the technology because that can always gotten around by the kinds of things that Andrew suggested. It's the teacher that matters. So if that person is there that has the vision, then uh, we can work with the circumstances. And, and I mean, there are many schools in the world that obviously don't even have electricity. And yet, there are chances and opportunities for people to walk into that community with a laptop and sit down with students and go back to a neighboring community and upload it. So it's a matter of just being flexible and, uh, and, and using whatever uh, technology is available. Yeah, just to jump in there, Steve, and, and reiterate what Aaron um, earlier said, in particular, I've just worked the last three years in China behind what we call the Great Firewall. And uh, you know, and a lot of things are blocked. As a, you know, and a lot of things are blocked in schools around the world generally. And I'm talking about deliberate blocking, not lack of access. And you just need to be flexible. You know, if YouTube is blocked, well, you use something else. Or um, if every blogging tool that you can <laughs> think of is blocked, well, you blog on a wiki. Uh, so it really is getting your uh, head around, um, not being set on a certain you know, set of specific tools, but being very generic, and knowing that there's always a way if you can find you, and you'll find it. Julie, is it important to actually seek out those cultures or places in the world where um, there are those barriers in order to um, to bring in the diversity that you might be looking for? It is important. It's also difficult, and I know you know. Ed, in particular, it's so great to have you here, Ed, because you've just done this for so many years and uh, you've done such a great job and it's not been a struggle uh, you know, getting a diversity of people into collaborations so that it's not too Western heavy or too you know, US heavy. Um, it is important and it's important to, and once again, we're talking about language barriers, we're talking about access, we're talking about tool set. Uh, I, had, I was speaking to a, a journalist in Italy the other day. She, she's writing an article about flat classrooms to try and encourage people to come into our projects or just try and encourage teachers to think more globally, generally. And she was saying, uh, there's not a lot of money, she said, but the government is spending the money on whiteboards. And I thought, oh dear, <laughs> that's a shame, really. So if there are any whiteboard enthusiasts in the room. But, but really, if you've got any money at all, uh, you need to perhaps think a bit more Broad, broadly than uh, a bit more broadly than technology integration with whiteboards or smartboards, uh, and really just try and support teachers with professional development uh, so that they understand what it means to build their own personal learning network with simple tools, uh, and then try and wire up the schools for better wireless connectivity so students can bring their own mobile devices. Uh, but you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit preachy here, but uh, certainly it's important to try and include as many different countries as you can and to reach out where you have the opportunity. Good point, uh, Julian. And you know, we see here where our support is so local and so you know, coming everywhere in our society. Um, if we have learned over the years that if that support is as local as possible, we're going to have a lot more chance to be diverse. Uh, so that uh, if there Make sure that there are teacher workshops in these various countries, because you know if our teachers are trained, but the other teachers aren't trained how to integrate this into their curriculum, then it's not going to happen. And so to have that support, have that workshop, have that training and professional development as local as possible, and is in many languages as possible, is key to really in, uh, enhancing that diversity. So we've talked about 
uh, geographic barriers, time barriers, and language barriers. What, what about cultural barriers? Uh, what have uh, any of you learned about how to treat uh, and be respectful of the cultural barriers? Go ahead, Anne. Uh, my students are geographically isolated, so for them to see Muslim students on a video camera is quite daunting for a start because the girls all wear covered um, bodies and heads. Um, I found that working with <coughs> the flat, <coughs> sorry, working with the flat classroom projects really helped us understand that. One of my girls on their avatar had a short sleeve T-shirt. Uh, sorry, it was a sleeveless um, T-shirt, but it was quite modest. She was asked to take that down by a teacher in Oman because it was offensive to them. So we had to work through that. Um, I also had a teacher in uh, Pakistan call one of my boys a girl and say, you're a pretty girl. I thought that boy would be highly offended, never come back on the camera again. But we talked it through, worked it through how we look different, they dress differently, etc. So I think it's talking it through all the time, working together why we are different and how we can make sure we don't offend each other. Yes, Anne, uh, you know, there, we all have anecdotes and stories, but the one thing we've learned very early on is that whatever project you do, you have to have a quick way to communicate because. In global collaboration, you know, the journey really is the destination because the things that happen are the teachable moments. And in our very first project Julie and I had, I had a, a boy, we had a boy in my classroom and a girl in her classroom that were paired up. And my student asked her student what she was going to be doing this weekend. And that is a very inappropriate thing in the culture that, that Julie was working in in Bangladesh. And um, we had to talk to the boy, and I didn't know that you know that was a problem. So we had to talk to the boy uh, about that. And you know, you can feel overwhelmed and say, "Oh dear, my students are going to make a mistake." But I think that as long as we as teachers are mature and know that things will happen and and questions will be asked that may be a taboo subject. And here in the states, you know, some people will say, "Oh, we don't have taboo subjects." Well, yes, we do. We do have taboo subjects, and uh, we need to be able to talk and communicate about those. So uh, just realize that to be open and, and be excited and not to be so upset when something happens. Um, we had a statue of David included in a video, and the way it was handled was not sensitive in treating it as a work of art. And so we had to discuss you know, what nudity is allowed in videos, and, and how can it be treated so that it's treated appropriately. Um, and not offensively. So we have so many different conversations that happen uh, with this sort of thing. Yeah, I think uh, that's an incredibly important question, Steve. Um, one of the ways that uh, that we've over we dealt with it is, is starting with the teachers, and it gets back to that initial question you asked us about how important it is for teachers to have their own cross-cultural interaction. It's critical in cases like this where teachers have to develop a sense of respect, a sense of, of appreciation for the other cultures before the students actually start interacting so that that culture of respect uh, is maintained throughout the entire process. And the other thing is that um, we put a strong focus on listening uh, as well as talking. And I think that helps also to, to listen, and especially because most of what we do is, is asynchronous. So there's a chance to listen, to read, and then digest and discuss, uh, perhaps before students uh, respond uh, from their own cultural perspective. The other thing that we found that helps is in, in the projects that we, we do, they're multicultural. So that in any one project, there may, there may be three, five, ten different countries involved. And so when you see different kinds of cultural perspectives on an issue, you're not looking just one to one and making that direct, well, it's us versus them. It's a matter of, oh, look at how the Brits do this, how the, the, the Argentinians think about this, or the Chinese. And so having that multicultural environment in which to look at the various issues, you, you see that, there, oh, there's, a, there's a, a, a myriad ways in which that particular issue can be addressed in different cultures. Um, can I just jump in here, Steve, as well, just to add, 
uh, in terms of different cultures, is also, and I think Jim put it into the chat uh, a while back, this um, how, how students learn their learning experiences within their own culture and how this emerges during uh, a global collaborative project. Uh, for example, many of our projects we ask students to co-create products and to collaborate on a wiki to co-create research. And we found, and this is a gross generalisation, but it's, it, there, are, there is some truth in it, we have found that um, students, particularly from Asian countries, tend to be more rote in their learning at this stage and they tend to uh, be very insular, uh, have not as much idea perhaps as in terms of how to collaboratively create something and they like to get things right and put their bit up on a wiki and put their name to it and, and that's it. Whereas um, other education systems perhaps have more of a, an idea of how to to work with, uh, with, an, with other people. And this relates, of course, also to the teacher expectation and assessment expectation for that particular task. But it's all very interesting. And I think you need to just step back. When you're in a project, you need to uh, step back and think, well, what are the cultures involved here? And why are they doing something different to what my students are different doing? And how, how do we deal with all of this? And how do we talk as a group of teachers? I think with Flat Classroom, we, we bring our teachers into real talking situations pretty much every week during a global project so we can discuss these things and, and level the playing field as we go through the project. I think that's really important as well. Lucy, in your work you talk a lot about professional generosity. How does that relate to connecting educators? Have we lost Lucy? Lucy, if you come back, we'll ask that question of you again. Ed, um, one of the things that you often say is that there's nothing called global ed in other parts of the world. Should that be our end goal, to, to not actually have this as a separate topic? Yeah, great question. Um, well, actually, there's two angles on that. Um, one is that, of course, most of the rest of the world takes for granted that interaction with the world is part of all parts of life, including education. Um, obviously, in Europe, uh, both the lingualism and, and interacting with people from other cultures is a daily experience. And so the whole idea of, of, of adding that as an important part of the curriculum is, is superfluous. Um, so you don't find global education initiatives in, in much of Europe. Uh, in other countries, it's more a sense that they know that they can learn so much from the rest of the world that there is so much out there that if using technology they can become at the core instead of at the periphery of knowledge that they are hungry to be engaged. And so to try to stimulate interest in things global is not necessary at all. And yes, and then the other issue is here it's uh, all parts of our curriculum as obviously this whole group agrees uh, should be it should be internationalized not just co adding a global studies course to a, a school's curriculum. But yes, uh, I think, ultimately, that if you're a math teacher, you, you will take for granted that or your kids are going to learn math better if, in fact, they're interacting on math issues worldwide because it's putting in a global uh, context. And so for me, yes, the goal is eventually to have a, a, a curriculum that doesn't say global because everybody assumes that every part of that curriculum should be global in nature. Thanks, Ed. Did we get Julie back? Did we get Lucy back? Oh, so what I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to shift here a little. Um, I want to give people who are um, participating the chance to ask questions of the panelists. So if you have a question for the panelists, you can either raise your hand. That's the third icon over in the participant window. And I'll give you the microphone and let you ask it by mic. Or feel free to put the question in the chat, and I'll try and shepherd them. While our participants are doing that, panelists, I'd love for each of you, if you have one, to tell sort of your favorite story of globally connecting, something that's a touchstone story for you. And we'll start with anybody who wants to. Well, uh, this is Vicki. And you know, my story happened two weeks into the first project. And uh, this three students came and lined up at my desk at break. And they said, Miss Vicki, we've got something to tell you. And this was the first flat classroom project. We had 23 students. 
I had 13, and then Julie had 10 or 11, and it's just a very small group of students. And they lined up at my desk two weeks into it, and they said, Miss Vicki, we've got something to tell you. And I said, oh, dear, what is it? Have I graded a quiz wrong? What have I done wrong? And they said, no, we need to tell you that the news media is wrong. And I said, well, what, what are you talking about? And they said, well, um, you can't believe everything the news media says because they say that all Muslims want to kill us, and that's not true because we've gotten to know these students, and we like them. And we've learned that you have to judge a person based upon who the person is, and you can't stereotype them based upon their country or their religion. And for a small town of 5,000 people in shrinking, in a small community, um, it, I realized that their worldview is changing in a very positive way to be more accepting of others and, and not just to take, not to stereotype. And so that for me, I knew I was hooked and, and that we had to keep going. That's a great story, uh, Vicki. Go ahead, Julie. Sure. My favorite story, I think, is the our first flat, flat classroom conference that we ran in, in Qatar, where we brought people from uh, Pakistan, Oman, Africa, USA, Australia. Um, Anne was there. Vicky was there, of course. And uh, the first day when we assembled 40 or 45 students in the room, uh, we, we had local uh, Qataris there as well. Um, everyone, the kids looked different from each other significantly different to each other. They sounded different. We had some non-English speakers in the room. And I just, I'll never forget Vicky standing at the front of the room and just getting everybody into the back channel. <laughs> they all had laptops. And here we all went into the back channel. And it was just an amazing thing to see and to witness and to see this, this uh, coming together of cultures in that uh, opportunity for them. So I want to take a couple of the questions that have come up in the chat. The rest of you can be thinking about your stories. Um, Durf did want to make sure that it was clear to everybody how to participate in each of your projects. So please feel free to, if the link isn't up on the whiteboard, to put it in the chat and draw attention to it again. And if you have a project like Tim in the, in the audience and you're not on the panel, please feel free to put those links up as well. Scott wants to know, how do we assess a student's global competence? Anybody want to answer that question? Um, I think this is an area that that needs probably a lot more development, Steve. It's Lucy, um, but the Asia Society has a great document. It's a free ebook that they put together with the Council of Chief State School Officers, and it talks about the four pillars of global competence. And I think they probably address um, assessment in there a little bit. So I'll find that link and I'll post it as well. But I just want to make sure that people are aware of this. Um, it's in the slides I posted, I mentioned it, but I'll get the direct link in a second. And how do you assess global competence? And I can see Anne's mic on, but I'm not hearing anything. Again, um, hard bandwidth for Anne there. Okay, so either an answer to the assessment question or a favorite story. Um, sure, maybe I'll, I'll back to playing fast. I'll do both. Um, yeah, I'm picking up on what Lucy just said. You know, for us, it's what does a student do with the interactive learning that they gain during projects? And so that action component, which is the fourth step of the uh, Asia Society's uh, definition of global competence, is important to us um, because that's in, in acting, in taking the learning into their community, into their lives. They're basically teaching others. And me, we, the demonstration of learning is when you can actually teach and, and share what you've learned. And for us, that action then is important. Um, I'll piggyback while I have the mic, so to speak. Uh, my story actually comes from um, uh, around another country. And it involves um, a visit I made to a school in South Africa a number of years ago. And in, uh, in Iron we when new teachers come um, or when workshops are being done around in different countries, including here, we have teachers send welcome messages kind of spontaneously uh, to welcome them and to demonstrate how global the support structure is. And, and I, you know, when a teacher uh, introduces his, him or herself, you know, we, uh, a number of us have done this so many times, we all know here's one more time we have to do this. And I walked into that school and I uh, was met by the principal who showed me a three-ring binder of about two, two inches thick 
of messages that they had received from uh, various school teachers from around the world. And it just drove home to me just how important not only to our own students uh, this, this interaction is in terms of the learning, but we need to keep in mind that we're having that exact same impact on teachers and students everywhere in the world. And for them to feel connected, uh, both teachers and students, and to be engaged with the world meaningfully is such a powerful motivational force in education that it, it, it caused me every time from then on to be enthusiastic about posting one of those welcome messages instead of thinking, oh no, one more. Jim Vanitis wants to know if anybody's aware of a good example of students connecting globally around science. Um, uh, I, I can share it. I mean, there are a number of projects in Ireland where students are working with other students on science projects. You know, the whole water measuring, water monitoring uh, projects as part of chemistry. They're actually studying phases of the moon. Does everybody know why the moon looks different in different parts of the, of the world on the same day? Uh, same time. Um, and so there are a number of those kinds of very interactive, very student-to-student -student, uh, collaboration on science projects. Um, another one on dams, you know, why they're not, what's the impact of building dams? Students are researching the environmental impact, but also the political, the economic impact of those uh, to study whether or not we should build them or whether or not we should keep them uh, in various parts of the world as well. You know, it's obviously science of water, hydrology, energy, all those various things are all wrapped up into each one of those projects. I can give you some links to them, to a description of them. You know, um, Shout Learning is a great website. There are a lot of different websites. Um, but citizen science is a very important part of flattening the classroom and collect, connecting globally, because we really have a responsibility, um, I believe, as educators to be part of citizen science. And I've been actually throwing some links. I throw in a link for NASA's citizen science work. and. Uh, as well as um, the, uh, the Shout Tree Banding Project, there's the Monarch Butterfly Project, there's so many great projects out there um, where we can be citizen scientists. And it doesn't take a lot of time. The Shout Tree Banding Project, you just go in and um, it's from uh, scientists in the Smithsonian who've realized that trees are growing faster than predicted in Virginia. And they were wondering what was happening in the rest of the world. And so students are actually doing that. And there is a way to tease out the noise um, or the incorrect readings that do sometimes happen in classrooms. But it's very important, I think, for all of us to be citizen scientists. And it should be part of every, uh, every classroom. So we only have a couple minutes left of the formal part of the program. Uh, we promised our panelists that they were committed for an hour. And panelists, if you want to stick around, you're welcome to. But we'll have an, a half hour sort of open conversation with those who are, who are here, um, more of a conversation rather than a QA. and a um, But I did want, uh, Lucy, I do want to give you a chance to address the question of professional generosity. And how does that relate to educators connecting with each other? Sorry if I missed it earlier. I got a phone call in the middle of everything. Um, so professional generosity is a term that I coined um, a couple of years ago when I had the, an encounter with a colleague who um, was phenomenal in what she was doing in her classroom. And I suggested that she blog about it and share about it with people because I felt that it's our obligation to do that for our peers. And she said, well, that may be your thing, Lucy, but it's not mine. And if people ask me for help, I just hit delete, delete, delete um, when I get these emails. And it distressed me quite a bit. And I've never forgotten it. And so I've made it a point that uh, to try and be as generous as I can uh, without being a doormat, obviously, uh, to colleagues and to other people because um, it just, I think being open about things really will make amazing opportunities happen for you and your students and, and the other parties. And so I think also in this day and age of education reform that we need to, every teacher is a teacher leader. And we need to step forward, and I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I still consider myself an educator. Um, we need to step forward and, and help people um, our colleagues be empowered. 
um, for you know, I think the mold of, of, of teachers being in their classrooms and being isolated is slowly changing, but we still have a lot of work to do in this. And as I travel around the country, the U.S. in particular, um, I'm just struck by how many people are still um, don't have access to the technology that we here on this panel enjoy for the most part. Um, they still don't have access to the vision of as the school leaders who believe this stuff is important. Um, and so we've got a lot of work to do. That's the bottom line. So um, I, I think that if you are professionally generous, it will come back to you in spades and will empower your career in ways that you never expected and will benefit your kids and improve the teaching and learning. Um, the world is really changing. Thanks, Lucy. Okay, so um, let's make this break. I'm actually going to clap for our panelists here. I'm going. I'm hovering over the smiley face in the participant window, and then I go down to applause. Thank you so much, panelists, for uh, sharing, for being professionally generous, and sharing your experiences. You, you're all terrific examples and heroes to me. Um, uh, we are now going to sort of switch to a more of a conversation style. If you need to go whether you're a panelist or a participant, uh, do feel free just to go. Uh, we understand. And, uh, um, but we're going to let those who would like to, to stick around. And I'm going to give microphone privileges to everyone. So feel free to raise your hand and grab the mic, uh, or put a note in the chat if there's something you want to talk about. And this will be very casual. Um, but if, if something didn't come up that you were hoping would, or if you um, have a question that didn't get answered, please feel free to uh, talk about it here. Thanks, everybody. I don't know what your schedules are like. Uh, but really appreciate uh, the panelists your, your being here. Hi there. Hi there. My name is Anjali Daryanani. I work for a global ed organization based in D.C., One World Youth Project. And I actually wanted to share an anecdote from one of our classrooms. Um, in here in Washington, D.C., we connect secondary schools internationally, and in D.C., we connected a high school with a high school in Pristina, Kosovo. And what happened was that cross-cultural dialogue, it sparked a trend where students were interested to learn about each other in the classroom. And um, what happened was there was one session where um, the students were prompted to learn about global issues and speak about global issues as they experienced it in their own eyes. And uh, this was a diverse, multicultural classroom, so um, there wasn't a lot of connection between students of different minorities within the classroom. But what happened was there was one student who, um, usually very quiet in this you know loud, rowdy setting, but she put her hand up and she asked to speak about an issue that she personally felt was important to her. So she went up to the front of the classroom and started speaking about um, immigration issues and how her immigration status affected her own access to higher education. And again, this was a particularly loud, busy classroom, but when she was telling that story, she got very emotional and um, you could hear a pin drop in the classroom. Everybody fell silent and everybody started listening to her. And that was something that was really interesting for us to see was this whole idea of students recognizing each other as humanity, and that's the whole purpose of it, right? Is the whole purpose of cross-cultural connections is for students to understand the connections across difference, and that can happen within students' very own classrooms and um, building cultural competence is a trend that I'd like to see more of in education in any way, shape, or form that that could happen. Thank you for that, and thanks for setting such a good example of taking the microphone. And, uh, we are getting some echo from you, Anjali, so if you want to turn your mic off, there you go. Perfect. So Maureen's asking, and in my experience so far, many of the schools we connect with are international schools. Most of the kids are not native to the country, only there for a year or two. How can we make more realistic connections or maybe more authentic is what you mean, Maureen? Uh, 
Uh, well, certainly, I mean, we'd be glad to help um, because each one of the iron organizations is indigenous, is local. So Iron Uganda is Ugandan. Uh, and so they work directly with the ministries of education in every country. And they recruit government schools. And there's some private, almost all the government schools. Um, and so by their very nature, the network is probably 99% uh, local or national government schools uh, as opposed to international schools. So there's lots of opportunities. I mean, obviously, it's not an either or. It's, it's both. Um, but clearly, we can help you link with, uh, with national schools in each country. Thanks, Ed, for that. Norman, I turned your mic off because we could hear you moving around. But if you want to turn it back on, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Can I talk now? Absolutely. So, okay, I just had an experience um, a long, well, not that long ago, but I participated with a group of students in a program called Project Icons, or International Community of Nations Simulation at the time, and it came out of the University of Maryland at College Park, and they had just extended it to high school students, and essentially, you became a nation of the world, and a scenario was developed, and you conducted their international relations for, actually, it was a three-month period. And it really was very exciting. The really interesting thing, if you wanted to, you could participate in one of the diplomatic uh, languages. And, our school chose to participate in Spanish. And so there were lots of translation issues. But there was one that particularly um, amused me, and I always like to tell the story. A young girl came in to see me, and she said, Mr. Constantine, I don't know what to make of this. There, Everybody from Europe is talking about this thing called the common store. And what they were talking about was the old common market. And I, I mean, it was, and it just brought home to all the kids not only cultural differences, but how they can affect translation. And so that was really fun. That's all. Thanks, Norman. I'm sure there are lots of stories from the panelists and others on the, uh, even within the same language, different ways of uh, describing something. I think uh, I'm looking at one of the comments here about the world becoming smaller. And I, you know, people have asked me, why is this so important now? Um, and I think it's because we have complex problems that are facing us. And these problems are going to require us to work across borders as the human race as opposed to individual countries. And our kids are going to have to be able to hit the ground running when they get out of college or high school or whatever uh, in terms of solving these problems. And they need those skills now, not when they get out of college. I think we probably have learned as adults 21st century skills for, you know, in the context of real life as we've uh, experimented in our careers. but. I think those kinds of skills could be taught to kids from the get-go so that they're ready to go and tackle these challenges once they get out of college or whatever their post-secondary experience is. Um, and the other thing, too, I think that we need to keep in mind is that, you know, I'd really like to see a definition of global education come about. Um, you know, we struggle with this, and I think there are different interpretations of it. Yes, it's multicultural awareness. Yes, it's universal education for those who aren't um, don't have access. But you know, how do we how do we make it? I, I would really love to see a manifesto come about by different groups and organizations that kind of spell things out for people a little bit more clearly. Because out of all the 21st century skills that have been listed in various books and that sort of thing the past few years, I'm wondering if um, if this one hasn't got as much priority as other ones. So those are just a few random thoughts. It has been interesting uh, during the last three days to hear um, 
different perspectives on technology and its ability to connect. Um, while some find the, the shortcomings, others find you know this tremendous kind of new ability to connect with different people in a different way through the technologies. It certainly feels as though in global education the technologies have been a core piece of the story in helping create opportunities for greater understanding. Um, another thing, I, this sometimes people get mad when I say what are things I am going to say now, but I still think we have to be very careful about exercising too much control over what the students do with each other and thereby making it artificial and them just puppets in what we want to see going on, particularly when they're not nice to each other. I think we have to give some time to letting them, um, well, short of it, fight it out, if you would, and uh, develop a, a respect for each other. That's all. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, um, Steve, you were talking about the, the power of technology uh, in this global connections. Now, for me, it's also an issue of justice. Because if we say that in the 21st century, our students, and in fact, students everywhere, are going to have to have what you know, are often called the 21st century skills, whether they be the ability to work in teams, global perspective, world languages, uh, technology familiarity, the only way that we're going to be able to enable all of our students across the country and around the world to, to gain those skills is through technology. So for me, it's a matter of uh, it's our responsibility uh, to make sure that this technology is able to connect every kid in the United States and elsewhere so that they have the same benefits and they are getting the same skills that we're expecting all of our citizens to have. Um, so I think it's, it's not only a good way, it's an imperative way uh, to be involved. I thought Norman's comment was so interesting because uh, maybe unspoken in that comment is the realization that kids are connecting cross-culturally on other platforms without adult supervision in ways that are maybe less structured um, and, and less curated. Um, and I am wondering about that tension between providing safe experiences versus authentic experiences. Is it, does any, did anybody else have a response to Norman's um, statement? Or any other questions or comments that you would like to make, please feel free to grab the microphone. And um, Norman made a uh, statement that he felt it was important for students to not be too restricted in their interactions with uh, students in Global Connections in order to have sort of authentic experiences. Um, I almost felt like it was a little bit like hearing John Taylor Gatto talk about global education. But I think most schools and educators that do these experiences work very hard to train the students to make sure there's cultural sensitivity and to avoid that kind of, that very kind of conflict. So I was curious because I think students who are connecting with international students online outside of school don't have those boundaries. And is it important to have a place where those boundaries are taught? Steve? Yes. Hey, it's T uh, Tim DeCipio. Steve? Hey, Tim. Yeah. Glad to have you on. Uh, great to be here. Great, uh, great dialogue. Well, I'd like to make a comment on safe versus authentic. Because I, yeah, and you know how I, I feel on this. I've been very vocal about it over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, they're really, it's not really an either or. I mean, any and every online experience a student has should be a safe one. And, you know, in the 16 years we've done ePals, I've never seen uh, a safe exchange that wasn't authentic. So I, I think we need to. I think we need to separate those things. I think what we're referring to here are education solutions that have the ability to policy manage 
or set roles and permissions or an on-task environment, which the teacher might need, right, versus uh, something that some people describe as uh, open range, uh, mass market tools, free, you know, sort of Facebook, Twitter, use it the way that, you know, 600 million other people use it. And, uh, you know, I might have a bias here because our, our platform gives a teacher, a school, a district, a ministry of education, the ability to set on-task roles and digital ecosystems that a teacher might need for a variety of reasons. It might be that they're very young kids and that teacher does not want them communicating with anyone else but the classroom in Perth, Australia that they're doing a project with. Or it might be a high school teacher that needs those high school kids who she feels are, are responsible to be super on task for two hours during some global project that's going on. And she doesn't want them distracted because it's a science experiment and those kids are only going to have about an hour to learn about plant photosynthesis. And she needs them super focused uh, on that project and absorbing all the information and the curriculum and the learning that's critical at that at that time. So and and you know it's interesting because I've been on the end of the spectrum where we've been you know at a conference or a roundtable discussion, and someone says, "Well, these education solutions, you know, we're focused too much on protecting kids and so worried and blah blah blah." You know, safety is just one aspect of having uh, a protected environment. Learning is the majority of why schools want the ability to set configuration on how the learning is going to occur and who's in that environment. And most of the teachers that use ePals are changing that environment every week. You know, we're going to do a different project today versus what we did last week. And so, uh, but I think everyone agrees on the call. Kids have to be safe, uh, regardless of, of how old they are uh, within the K-12 uh, environment. So, but I, I would love to talk more about this. I don't know how uh, others feel. Uh, if in some way some tools are restricting access to learning, uh, I mean, I'd love to have a dialogue on that. It sure looks like Norman is ready to have that dialogue. I'm not sure that we're, we're going to have time here to do that. But I think it's an interesting tension between student agency, a, a trend toward looking at student-directed learning and the cultivation of safe environments. And I agree with you, Tim. I don't think those are mutually exclusive, but I do think they are a little bit in tension. Any other thoughts on that, or anybody else want to respond? Um, I would like to say something again, because it, it was a real situation where I didn't um, at first know what to do, but again, it was in the project icon simulation. And it was all actually done out of a central computer, well, a central mini computer at College Park. And all, everybody logged into that computer. Well, we had some pretty savvy computer kids in the classroom, and we were in an international relations simulation. And a couple of the kids said to me, I think I can hack this mainframe or this mini and we can read everybody's mail and we'll be at a great advantage should we do it. And I had to come up with an answer. And in an international relations simulation, as we all know, countries are doing that to each other all the time. So I said, go ahead. Now, does that make it unsafe? Did I do something wrong? Uh, and well, I think the conversation is kind of more I about, uh, I, I, I th if I'm not mistaken, I, I think what the conversation is more about is uh, eight tools that are designed specifically for K-12 uh, ed tech versus mass market tools like Twitter, Facebook, and you know, general 
products that are not designed specifically for education but can be used. Uh, and w when and where are we using different things? Um, you know, like ePals or Edmodo, Gaggle. Uh, these are some of the education solutions. So I want to ask, and uh, let me what, ask do these, what do these products do that enable 21st century education tasks? Uh, and I and I and I think again I might have a I'm a I have bias here because this is the space that we're in, but I'm also speaking for 12 other competitors that um, if you look at what educational tools are providing schools now, it's one completely integrated system, you can turn things off, you can use it open, and by, by the way, the student-owned learning, there's student-owned learning going on every second of the day with Edmodo or ePals or Gaggle, so we have to you know, throw that out too. But this is a lot of the heated debate at a lot of these conferences that, that you go to, and I was just on a panel where people were saying, we have to let the kids use Facebook because that's the only tool they want to use. In, our, in my experience, kids don't want their teachers in their, in their friends groups. Uh, you know, they want to separate the two. Most kids will tell you, you know, I would rather have an education platform to do my collaboration. So anyway, probably discussion for another time, but um, I'm glad it came up. I, I am too. And Ann Merchant made a comment in the chat about a situation where I think it was her students uh, posted something in a blog post that was offensive to some other students. So I'm really curious as to how that gets handled, meaning there may be times when someone else is offended by something that we didn't say to intend offense or that is a part of a student's culture. And uh, uh, are there times when you allow the tension to exist without resolving it because it does represent differences in culture? Um, you know, in the case of taking down the picture of the girl with a sleeveless uh, shirt on, um, would anybody ever make an argument that it's important that um, there be compromise on both sides? I would make the something actually yeah, happened to like me with say, a class in the Platt classroom uh, project. One, I think that could happen in a classroom uh, between kids from the same town. They can say things that are offensive to another and not realize it's going to be offensive to another group. For instance, I'm thinking specifically during my student teaching program, which was actually a multicultural, uh, had a multicultural component to it. Um, we had uh, somebody who had very strong religious beliefs do a presentation on something that he meant a lot to him, but it was offensive to others. And so you're going to run into that. That's life. And so I very much believe in having those real life awkward conversations and leading people through it. And what that requires is teachers who are sensitive and who can guide people through those kinds of conversations. If we try to avoid it and sanitize everything, um, that's just easy. That's just the easy way out. What we need are people who are going to artfully go in there and help. The other thing in terms of, you know, student behavior and that sort of thing, let's not punish Let's, let's separate behavior from the technology, too. I think that's the one thing that we also need to think about. And, um, you know, just like in a classroom, proximity keeps your physical proximity of the teacher keeps the kids engaged and keeps the kids aware of what they can and cannot do and that sort of thing. And just like that, teachers also need to be engaged with these tools and monitoring what's going on. Not to be uh, sanctioning kids, but just to be be in touch with them. So well, what about okay. just putting safety and behavior aside for a second? What about curricular functionality? What what are people's thoughts about uh, tools that are more curricular in design and enable you know an array of tasks being required now of 21st century teachers and, and, and students in terms of what is being expected of them in the creation and sharing of their work? Because that you know, because that's something that you know, I, I think is extremely important right now. I mean, even with my own kids, uh, you know, they're not, only 9% of U.S. schools have given their kids any kind of school-based solution to get everyone collaborating on the same page. This is a, I mean, this is a, a, 
a huge obstacle right now. I mean, we're scratching our heads wondering why our schools aren't moving along faster and making global connections. But yet, um, you know, is the, is, the, is the US DOE or the Australian DOE, state DOEs, are, they, are, are we strongly encouraging, even mandating through funding or holding back funding, uh, until schools do the entry point technologies to get everyone starting to communicate and share their work. And this is, something, this, this is a global problem. This isn't a U.S. Uh, problem. But I, I see it. I, I travel. You know, Ed travels internationally. You, Lucy, uh, you do too, Vicki. I mean, you, I mean, I think we're all seeing the same thing. The question is, why aren't schools and districts, DOEs, MOEs moving fast enough? And I, I think it's they're kind of confused the right now. It's I not because there's not confused. the ideal tool out there. The tool really is not the important thing. It's the mindset and the philosophy and having, and what you believe about education, what you believe about how students and teachers should interact. Um, and I see districts all over the place. And I'll give you an example of one that's not necessarily a globally connected district, I, although I think they'll probably get there down the road. Um, I'm thinking of Joe Morlock. Uh, he's a tech director in Canby, Oregon. And, and around mobile devices, they've empowered their teachers to um, manage their devices and the apps on and that sort of thing, as opposed to having everything controlled by, by a central lo location. And they believe in making things as easy as possible so that their teachers can run and, and with their classrooms and do as much as they can in their classrooms. And, and it's, Every decision, I think, in that district goes back to how do we empower teachers to be the best that they can be. They fundamentally trust their teachers. And in lots of places in this country, we, we're, we can't get over this. We don't trust our students, and we don't trust our teachers. And so it's a vision and mindset thing. No magic tool is ever going to solve that. So I, I feel very strongly about this. Well, I don't think we're talking, again, we're talking about, it keeps going back to behavior, but that's not what I'm talking about anymore. It's about curricular functionality. I mean, you can integrate Google Docs, Microsoft tools, all that stuff into any platform that's created to help teachers and students do more tasks and, and, you know, and be more efficient. And that's where I think a lot of the conversation has to go right now. Right now, people have eight usernames and passwords when they can have one for the whole day, be into their email, their virtual workspaces, their storage, the, even docs and their Microsoft stuff. I mean, that, that's how far advanced these platforms have come. And I think this is a problem. I meet teachers all the time that say, I just can't handle any more tools. They're all kind of siloed, and they're, they're different things for different tasks. I think this is a huge I, problem. I disagree. I think really good tech directors know how to manage this and how to present it to their faculty in a way that is not overwhelming. Yeah, and I think they're I the think, ones um, that can't do it because their networks are just the really networks are, are just crushed. What they're doing. I, 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 again, it's not the tool that's the problem. It's the administrative mindset about how and why we're using this and what what we're trying to get at. And I think. Um, you know, curriculum does have a part in it, but there's there's no tool that's going to be perfect for that for the curricular uses. What I think we should, I think our teachers need more emphasis on what good pedagogy is and what the different techniques are and how technology can support that. And frankly, we don't have a great understanding like of, of that sort of thing fundamentally. Yeah, I, I uh, well, I, I again I. Well, it's about technology, but it's about the kinds of technology can, that can make this efficient. And uh, there's, no, and I think people just don't understand. Uh, you know, this panel I was on, I asked all three people who were talking about Facebook, Twitter, in the classroom, "Have you ever seen a demo of an education platform?" None of them had. Yet they were sort of selling the audience against it. And I would ask, you know, people on the panel who are talking today, you know, have you used, you know, three or of the 15 products that are out there to understand what they do. Because every quarter, they're, they're, they're changing, you know. Um, but, you know, you know this, this is where I think the DOE has to start, you know, getting involved. And it's not just the space ePals, Redmodo are in. It's online math, online assessment tools, grade books, things like that. I mean, we, we, I don't think there's a road map that's, that's really been put out there in terms of what districts should do. No principal is going to roll out Facebook or Twitter 
for their elementary and middle schools. That's just not going to happen. I think I don't think we can expect that of them, right? Because if there's uh, Tim, I'm going to close us. <laughs> We're done. Yeah. <laughs> no! I think I think uh, <laughs> I think there are two different lenses at at work here, and I'm not sure that we're that spending any more time at this particular juncture is going to bring us closer to resolution. But valuable conversation. I'm going to close us up. Thanks for attending, everybody. Thanks for being active participants. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everybody. Norman, really appreciate it. Lots of fun. Uh, hope you have a great month with Connected Educator Month, and that we'll have more of this good conversation. Take care, and bye now. <laughs>